meager praise coming from a daughter. <laughs> I have a good housekeeping. First of all, I want to thank Jennifer for filling in her old man's shoes. Uh, by summer I turned 78 and I said I was going to retire, but here I am. <laughs> the second thing I want to say is that when I first called our main speaker, I asked him if he could speak for 15 or 20 minutes. He said, I don't even get through the introduction in 15 or 20 minutes. So that might give you some hint as to where we'll be going as far as this is concerned. When I started on this journey 18 years ago, to give voice and funding to our state parks. It did not take me long to realize that the fountainhead of it all was money. I'm not referring to money that's been flowing through the mail and cocktail parties right now to meet the December 8th deadline of contributions to state officials. I'm talking about building a solid case that parks pay for themselves either directly or indirectly and <clears throat> that we needed to make that statement of that financial position to the legislature so that they would give us sustainable and substantial increase in funding. At almost the same time that I was coming to this conclusion, I happened to read a journal or a case study that had four little snippets of four state parks and the economic impact they had on the community. I said, who did this study and is there more to it? And two or three people told me, Dr. John Crompton of Texas a and I placed a call. When the phone was answered, I thought I'd gotten the American Field representative of the National Trust of England. <laughs> a distinctly British chap was on the line. But he assured me that he was Doc Dr. John Crompton, university distinguished professor, regents professor, and presidential professor for teaching excellence at the Department of Recreation, Parks, and Tourism Sciences at Texas A&M University. From that call to this day, the study we put together on each individual park, first in 1990, uh, 2005 and then updated in 2014, has become the gold standard for economic impact not only here in Texas, but across the country. I can't tell you how many phone calls and emails I got asking for copies of the study. But I do know, in speaking to national groups, people have come up and said, I read your study. Well, it wasn't really my study, it was John Crompton and his staff study. The main reason, aside from the data itself, it is done with the integrity of the author. The works are clean and supportable, and they have never been challenged. So join me in welcoming Dr. John Crawford. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> We're good to go, yeah? Microphone on. And so the important part about George's generous introduction is uh, that you have to note is that I'm not a native Texan. <laughs> if you haven't figured it out before I open my mouth, you've got to figure it out now. So the only thing that cuts me off is when people accuse me of having an accent. <laughs> it is, ladies and gentlemen, the English language, and it's your accent, right? Texas 45 years now, so I'm not so, not so sensitive to it as I used to be. But I have to tell you, uh, I was back home about 
uh, probably 10 years ago now, just before my mother passed away. She was 97 when she passed out. And she says, lads, she was in the nursing home and she leaned forward in the chair like she did when she got agitated. And she says, lad, I know you're not in school out there and you're doing something useful with your life, but you know, I'm your mother, lad. You really don't have to show off to me with your Texas accent. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this problem of, you know, of, of, of uh, I'm, I'm sort of in the middle of it. The British get me wrong and the Americans get me wrong, but I am who I am. So my comments today um, are informed also. You know, some of us get a little bit dumber as we get older. And so uh, uh, some time ago, I got myself elected to the city council. And, um, you know, I did three elections and I won them. And uh, our city council in College Station has, uh, we are budget 300 million. The seven of us were on the city council. I was the mayor pro tem for a while. I'm not on it anymore. Uh, the, the, uh, my good friends at the Tea Party who couldn't beat me at the ballot box, they had this, uh, they had this recall election and, and they failed there too. So then they went to the president of the university, Bowen Lofton, and they said, we see Crompton on television here and uh, on a Thursday afternoon doing this stuff in the city and he's a, a state employee and he should be working from eight till five. And so he steals from the state and so you need to fire him and so they put on a, a, a forensic uh, internal audit on it so the only saving grace was Bowen had called me and he said look I have to put this audit on you but if they, if they nail you they nail me because I know what you're doing so nothing's going to happen but we're going to have this audit and it was at that point forensic audits are not nice and it was at that point that my wife announced to me that I was all done with politics and I wouldn't be doing it anymore so I'm not involved in it anymore but my comments are informed by those many years on the College Station City Council. So when Jennifer called me and asked me if I would speak today, I said, well, I, you know, I don't know much about children in nature. And she said, well, it's not children in nature that we want to know about. What we want to know about is how do we get more money for children in nature and how do we make it more politically relevant? And so that's what I'm going to talk about. Having minimal knowledge of programming and the kinds of things that you do, I went to the websites to see what it was that you, what benefits you, you produce from this stuff. So it's in my mind, it's all about what we call positioning. And here is the existing position you have in people's minds. Most taxpayers and elected officials think parks, trails, nature conservation, children in nature are perceived to be a relatively discretionary non-essential government service. They are nice to have if we can have some resources left over after we've done the important things. And that's where you sit in most elected officials and taxpayers' minds. And so we need to move that and reposition it so that parks, trails and nature conservation spaces are perceived to be, and this is the key point, central contribution to alleviating the major problems in a community identified by taxpayers and decision makers. You don't get money and resources unless you solve a problem. And so that's what I want to focus on. Many years ago, one of my friends in England, Sue Glyptis, wrote, it was about 1990, wrote a nice little book called Leisure and Unemployment. And, and in there, Lu, she, uh, Sue, Sue wrote something that really resonated with me. And this would be about 1990 and put me onto this stuff. She said, the provision of leisure and substitute children in nature for leisure. The provision of leisure for its own sake still lacks political clout. It has to show other more tangible returns, such as jobs, urban regeneration, alleviating delinquency or whatever to be worth funding. On its own, children in nature is too flippant. It carries real political conviction only if advocated for other instrumental reasons too. And so there are several implications about positioning. First, it's a relative rather than an absolute concept. And so what the most important functions of government. I won't tell you how they're derived, but these are accurate. At the top, which is off the screen, is education. That's the most important thing local government does. And then it's about hospitals and health. And then it's police. And then it's welfare. And then it's public works. And then it's transportation. And then it's fire. And then it's housing and community development. And then it's economic development. And then it's tourism. Then 
its parks and recreation, and we thank the good Lord for arts and libraries. And so, <laughs> you've done these studies, and you've done these studies of your programs, and people are very satisfied, highly satisfied, and think they're wonderful, and you get no more money. Go back one. And why is that? Well, the answer is you might be wonderful at what you do, but you're not very important. That's the problem. And the way that you're going to get more resources for what you do is to climb that ladder so you become more important. It's to act with these things up here which are important, and only when you do that, no matter how brilliant a job you do down here, when you get more resources, you have to climb that ladder to relate to something that is important. Second point about positioning. Legislators' political platforms represent residents' concerns. So when I got elected to the City Council, I said to my guys in Parks and Recreation, look, I, I got elected on this platform. These are the things I said to the voters I'm going to do. Now, if you guys in Parks and Recreation can help me get there and fulfill my contract to the voters, then I'm going to get all the resources I can to you to help me fulfill my contract. But if you guys are going to do what you've always done and it doesn't relate to solving these issues that I ran on, forget it. It ain't going to happen. That's my contract of integrity with the voters. So you have to ally with the politically important things in your community or you will not, and its legislators from an integrity point of view should not give you resources. <clears throat> the challenge then is not financial. I said to my guys in conversation, parks and recreation, don't ask me for more money. Because in this day and age, the pie is not going to get any bigger. It ain't going to happen. I'm not going to raise taxes. If I do, I'm out of office tomorrow. I'm not good to you. So it's no use you going in and saying, I want to make more money, or you want to make the pie bigger. It's not going to happen. So what you have to do is demonstrate that you can solve those problems at the height of that ladder better than other people do. That you have something unique to bring to the table so you can take resources from others. And that's the reality of our situation. So, the big idea associated with reposition is that funds are, and this is the key phrase, invested in solutions to a community's most pressing problems. The term investing suggests a positive, forward-looking agenda with a return on the investment, which you have to demonstrate. More about that in a moment. Elected officials have no mandate to fund programs. They have a mandate to invest resources into solutions of the community's problems. That's the key to repositioning. So let me give you a couple of examples, and let me start with Mr. Bristol. He and I have worked together now for many, many years. And Mr. Bristol got us together, as I recall, George, you, Walt Dabney, and I in Houston in about 2002. And Mr. Bristol sat us down and said, OK, Texas State Parks are ranked 49th out of 50. They're a disgrace. They're a shambles. They're not getting funded, and nobody in the legislature cares. We're going to turn that around. And he committed to doing that, and he's, we brainstormed how to do that. And he came up with the idea of economic impact studies. And so that's what we did. We transformed, we repositioned state parks, not as places to go for a picnic, ride a bike, or family bonding, or all the other nice fluffy stuff, but important stuff. What the legislature cares about is economics. That's what they care about. That mightn't be our main consideration, but that's where the money is, and that's what they care about. So that's what we tied to. And under George's direction, we reposition state parks in the minds of legislatures as economic engines because state parks attract non-resident visitors to the area, people from outside the area. Those visitors from outside the area bring new money into the area. And that new money creates income and jobs for the area residents and from the Legislature, or the legislator in that area, income and jobs is what it's all about. 
for that legislator to get re-elected. And so, let me give you an example of how that works. Let's take Mustang Island. So, in 2008, the leg or 2009 legislature, we're in the middle of the Great Recession has hit, and the legislature want to shut stuff down. They've got no money, they're in a terrible state, they want to, what I suggest is we're going to close state parks. And so, we look at Mustang Island State Park. And we say it gets 145,000 visitor days. Uh, the salaries and the operating expenses that come in from Austin amount to $809,000 that comes in to Nueces County from the city of Austin. In addition to that 809,000, they get 632,000, which comes in from visitors who uh, spend money in the local, uh, in the local area, oh sorry, uh, the revenue they get from, uh, from uh, admissions to the park is 632. So if I six, 632 from the 809, that should be over there, they should be lined up, then we lose 177. The state park lost 177,000, shut it down. We can't afford in the Great Session to be running state parks at that kind of a loss, and that's reciprocated all across the 80 odd state park system. But wait a minute, Madam Legislator from Nueces County. 49% of those visitor days, that's 71,000 of them, are from outside the county. And on each visitor day, they spend $9.76. My, my troops were out there doing this stuff and they're asking people. Each outside the park, but inside, uh, they spend that each outside the park, but inside Nueces County. So that comes to $678,000. So new money to the county is the 809,000 that comes into Austin, from Austin, plus the 698 that comes in from outside visitors spending it outside the park, 1.5 million. Now they have this multiplier effect and there's this magic thing that goes boom, 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 boom in some miraculous way and it gets transformed up to some big number like this and it's a load of nonsense, absolute claptrap. But nevertheless, if you do multipliers correctly and, and, and do them properly, then you come up with a number of 1.3 million, which is the impact on personal income. And so the, the people in Nueces County are receiving an income in their pockets, 1.3 million, and it's creating 46 full-time jobs. And so, Madam Legislator, you close the county, that money goes away, and you lose 46 jobs. We've changed the debate. This is not about some flippant nice to have if, uh, if, if, if we can afford it. This is about real stuff, it's about real jobs, and that's the kind of stuff that gets me re-elected. For Madam Legislator, for every dollar of net state funds invested in, uh, in Mustang Island State Park, you get, in your district, $7.83 in income. So you'll recall that the net loss is 177000 this is the income, 1.3 million. That's one dollar gives 78, 7 to 83, comes into your, into your district. The cost of the state of each job created is 3,800. If you're creating jobs in the state of Texas for 3,800, you're a hero, because that's far, far, uh, far cheaper than putting people on welfare and so on. And so, so, so we are transforming the debate. And now when you go to the legislature, we, what George did, was make sure this information got in the hands of every state superintendent and those superintendents went to every, uh, every um, uh, organization in the area, the Lions Club, the Rotaries, the, all the rest of them, every organization is looking for speakers and in your district there's dozens of organizations looking for speakers, they got to fill, fill every month so you can get on the program and you put home this message, it's about jobs and income. And further, Madam Legislator, it's sort of analogous to a retail store. If you're in a retail store, you don't go into the store because of how it looks on the outside. You go for what's inside the store. And so, legislature, if you invest in services and amenities in the park, in, uh, in programs and in interpretation, in campsites and so on, then what happens is you get more visitors. And more visitors spend more money there and they stay longer, so you get more jobs in your area and more income to your local people and they get it. And we have changed 
the debate. We have repositioned parks now as economic engines and, 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 and we have been hugely successful in transforming the state parks budget as a result. Let me give you another couple of examples. In my community, I wanted to build an indoor swimming pool. Now, you have to bear in mind, we've got 10 outdoor pools, and this is Texas. And, and, and I'm going to get all kinds of criticism. In fact, where I wanted to build the indoor pool, adjacent to the middle, new middle school, there was an outdoor pool a quarter of a mile away. But you know, you can't teach kids to swim in Texas outdoors in October, November, December, January, February, and March when they're in school. You can't do that. I mean, it's just miserable out there on some of those winter uh, nor'wester things coming through. And so I wanted an indoor pool. Now, I couldn't sell an indoor pool. I mean, I knew I couldn't do it. And so we did the math. The medium home value in the community was 150,000. Construction cost of the natatorium was to be 2 million. So the annual property tax payment for the average homeowner will be 12 bucks. Uh, the annual operation and maintenance cost 100,000. It's another six bucks. So it costs you 18 bucks a year. To, to, to build and operate this new pool. That's $1.50 a month. You know, far less than you're going to pay for a coffee at Starbucks. $1.50 a month. Now, in most years, there are heartbreaking stories in the local news media of children from this community who have drowned in area lakes. Happens every year. We've got Somerville and Livingston and these lakes around, and, and, and kids get drowned. So an agreement with the, with the ISD means that every fourth grader in the community will be taught to swim. So lives will be saved. And so here was the key. How to reposition this from people at Crompton swimming laps and having fun in a pool to invest $1.50 a month and save a child's life. And the thing passed despite full opposition from the school board who didn't want anything to do with the swimming pool. Despite the opposition from the school superintendent and the principals who didn't want it, we won by 90 votes and they got stuck with it. So we got an indoor pool. We did that by repositioning it because saving a child's life was important. It wasn't about uh, the action, it was what the action did for people. It's not about your programs, it's what the programs do for children, the impact. They're not compared as concerned with what you offer, they're concerned with the impact on those children of what you offer. One more. I'm in a, I'll put it back on, take it back a moment. I'm in a department called Recreation Park and Tourism Sciences, RPTS. Now we're in the College of Agriculture, and everybody else has 14 departments in the College of Agriculture, and everybody else is a gene jockey. I mean, they're all, you know, they're splitting DNA and they're doing hybrids and they're cloning cats and whatever. I mean, biological stuff. And I do recreation parks and tourism sciences. <laughs> so every time Dean comes in, they look at that. We just got another one now, Patrick Stover, who's going to be terrific. I was on the interview panel. He's, he's come down from Cornell, member of the National Academy of Sciences, top of the line and he's looking at recreation parks and tourism sciences. So, so we have this reputation. So you go around the community and they say, well, that means rather party than study. <laughs> Rest and play through school. Really pointless, time-wasting studies. <laughs> Rambunctious, partying, tipsy students. Rather play than study. And all of this stuff which anybody associated with recreation can identify with that's how you're regarded so I go up to Patrick and I say look let me tell you about what we do first of all we do recreation get past the label recreation is about community development and social interaction that's what we do and recreation action activities are merely a vehicle to facilitate community development and social interaction. And in this era of angst and, and separation and so on, that's important. And so parks. And that's about environmental sustainability. And third, what we do is tourism. And that's about economic development. And Patrick, let me tell you something. The people of Texas, you might think, you're, you know, you're in a department which does marvelous science, cutting-edge science. 
But the people of Texas could care less. Now, the people of Texas care profoundly about community development and social interaction, environmental sustainability, and economic development. And when you go in front of the legislature, the legislature will identify with that much more than be impressed by you clowning one more cat or one more cow or something. I mean, this is important stuff for the legislature. And so you transform the debate. You reposition us from being this laughable, peripheral, unimportant sideline to being suddenly up front and centre in his mind because if he wants money from the legislature, we're going to be central to him getting it. He's going to get money for this much easier than he is to clone another cow. And so we've changed the debate. And that's the challenge which is facing you, to change the debate. <coughs> So when I look at that list of benefits, it's too, too vague. Some of these things are actions. And what I need is outputs, to measure outputs. And so instead of the, you know, I, 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 and I've got to have those that are important to the community. And so here's what you do. The first question any organization should ask itself is, the classic question that Ted Levitt gave us in the foundation of our of marketing in 1960 in the Harvard Business Review, what business are we in? What business are you in? And you spend a lot of time addressing that because everything flows. And you measure it in what, how you want to be seen in the public's eyes. What do they, not you, not your professional view, what do they want to see you doing? What Outputs are important to them. Now, you have 20 benefits that I saw on, that, so those, uh, on those lists I put up. Focus on one or two. You've got to focus. In state parks, George had us doing economic impact. Uh, it might be something different in your community, but select just one or two positions. So in some communities and College Station, it was about economic development. In some, it may be about health that's the issue. In others, it might be about youth crime and safety. In others, it might be unemployment. In others, it might be education, after school programs. Pick one. Just one or two and go on the political narrative that's dominating in your community. Pick that political narrative and zoom in on it as to how you can tie into it because that's where the money is. All right, so... <clears throat> Don't try to change people's minds. Refocus their minds. Once we pointed out to them the economic impact of state parks, they could go, oh yeah, now we get it. I mean, there was a nexus in their minds. We weren't trying to introduce them to something that didn't make any sense to them initially. Something that makes sense they can identify with. Reinforce the intuitive. If the linkage is evident, it will work. The uh, pioneers of this stuff were, were um, uh, Jack Trout and Al Rice, who wrote a series of articles in Advertising Age in the early 1980s, um, uh, we, who introduced the whole concept of positioning to the marketing field. And here was their counsel. They wrote a, a great book in 2000 which summarized this stuff. Experience has shown that a positioning exercise is a search for the obvious. These are the easiest concepts to communicate because they make the most sense to the recipient of a message. And so, so don't try to be clever with this. Take the obvious position. What does children in nature, in my world, parks and recreation departments, bring to addressing the issue that is unique and distinctive, that's different from what others do? You're looking for the compelling reason they should invest in children in nature. What do you bring that the others don't that address this problem? That's your position. And your logo, your website, your Facebook, your Twitter, your, and all the other things I don't understand about social media, your publications, your public presentations, all of it focuses on that one point. Don't get off message. George never lets us get off message. It's all economics. It's always, you have to keep reinforcing it. Bear in mind that your audience is going to turn over. We're 
in the legislature this time, of which George has told me, at least 50% of them won't have a clue what state parks are about. They don't know. They're square one. They know because they turn up. So you have to keep hammering, hammering, hammering at the same point over and over again. Now and focus. Consider positioning reflects people's beliefs and value systems. They are hard, even when their nexus is conceptually logical, it's hard to get them on side and, and, and get that established in their mind because they're unused to it. Agencies are not very agile. It takes us a while to turn around and do things that actually deliver on the promise and the position which we have indicated. And so given those two things in mind, the time frame is relatively long. This is not going to happen in a year. It took us, George, probably four or five years before we made real traction in the legislature and to get us to where we are today. It's not going to happen overnight. So you have to be committed to this over the long term, never focus over and over again, an output that's important in the political narrative and not the program, but what it does for the community is the key. All right, so I'm just going to talk now about a few of these options. When you've got that position, you obviously need the science behind it to justify it. And, there's, there's, and, and that's not difficult to do. You go to your local university. If you're anywhere near Texas a and you can come to me and I get my graduate students on it. And you say to them, give me the science on, if we're going to talk about mental health and stress relief, give me a synopsis of the science in that. So what legislature and say this is my unique, my unique selling position, I've got the evidence behind me, which is what George had us do and running down getting these economic impact studies done. So, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about the science of these potential positions that you might adopt. The first one, of course, is stress and mental relief. And, and how does that tie into it? Well, you know, I look at this gun debate that's going on, and I'm not going to take decides on, on whether we should have guns or we shouldn't and all of that. But what I do see is a bunch of political, uh, uh, political support for mental health programs as a solution. Now, whether it is a solution or not, I'm not going to debate. I don't care. Oh, of course I care. Uh, from a political point of view, there's a bunch of folks who believe that, and it's an easy solution for the guns deal, this mental health thing. So if I can tie in with that, then uh, that looks to me like it might be a winning position in that particular situation. Uh, whatever, look for the opportunity, how you tie in with mental health. And here's some, you know, we know that 43% of the population have health issues due to stress, which um, uh, goes back a long time. Fred Olmsted was the founder of, uh, of, um, of uh, Parks in America. Uh, legendary figure and the Olmsted firm built over 400 parks in America over uh, from about uh, from starting with Central Park in 1857 and all the way through Rick Olmsted still building them in the 1940s and and here's what Fred Olmsted said back in 1960 1865 the intuition was always there his his conviction he was writing at, at the in the Yosemite report he did employs the mind without fatigue and yet exercises it, tranquilizes it, and yet enlivens it. And thus, through the influence of the mind over the body, gives the effect of refreshing rest and revigoration to the whole system. This notion that participation in parks and involvement in parks uh, can refresh you and refurbish you is intuitively obvious, and it goes back a long way. Which brings me to my friend Roger Ulrich. Um, Ulrich uh, is a professor at Texas A&M, actually he's just retired, and, uh, and uh, Roger did his seminal work which first tied nature to uh, stress back in the early 1970s in his PhD dissertation at Delaware. He launched this whole field of which there's a substantial literature today. Roger was kind enough to lend me his slides. This was Roger's PhD dissertation which was published in Science in about 1970. Science is the most prestigious uh, 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 academic journal out there. If you publish in Science, you're made for life. Roger's article was published. A seminal piece, everything sprang from this. So what Roger did, was he went to a hospital in Delaware 
and there were eight hospital rooms here one two three four five six seven eight and it was a wing where people all had the same operation I think it was a gallbladder operation if I remember correctly and in those days that was a big deal you were in hospital for a week or so it wasn't like today and so these rooms looked out on different things these four rooms looked out on a park these four rooms looked out on a brick wall Roger's simple question was who gets better fastest and so he uh, that's what he did his dissertation on if you looked out on a brick wall that's what you saw if you looked down a park that's what you saw these are Roger's slides and so what did he find he compared the tree group and the wall group uh, um, uh, reactions the tree group spent 7.96 days in hospital this was over a three-year period he was going back and looking spent on average 7.96 the wall group 8.7 the tree the wall group spent an extra day in hospital well who cares an extra day well you know having being a, a, a frequent visitor to hospitals and and, uh, and, um, and uh, being a, a, a very frequent recipient of their bills extra day in hospital 10 to 15 bucks a thousand bucks a day uh, yeah you know the odd you know day here and there add them up it, it's real money you're talking about here the tree group had five fewer minor post-surgical complaints complications the tree group had fewer negative evaluative comments in the nurses notes which he analyzed and the wall group had more doses of pain groups classified as moderate or strong and the importance of that is that those uh, strong uh, groups are are the expensive drugs those are the most expensive drugs so so here's what happened with the drugs when you come out of an operation and, and I'm a veteran of these things in the first day you there's no difference I mean you're not looking at anything you're out of it <laughs> and, but between days two and five here's what we saw the wall group strong got 2.48 doses the tree group only 0.96 doses of the strong medicine Similarly, with the moderate medicine, the wall group had twice as many as the tree group. And then, of course, the reverse happens with the weak medicine. The tree group got twice as many as the strong group. But, but you see, these are the inexpensive, um, inexpensive drugs. Jen, press, please. <coughs> and so Roger came to A&M, and he's now rigged up with all this, all, this, all this stuff. And what Roger does is he put electrodes on people we're not talking about psychological feelings here we're talking about physiological measures and of course you can do things with students that you can fairly inexpensively and, and with it you can never do in real population and so and so Roger run, ran experiments for years on these things and I'll share some of them with you they're fascinating so so the first of these experiments he's got um, he's got uh, a, 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 a this virtual reality thing and he's got a 10 minute video of work injuries and automobile accidents done by professional act, uh, actors um, but it's all gore, blood and gore it's a mess I mean, it's, I mean you look at this thing and it, oh, it was horrible to look at immediately he's done that he gave them uh, recovery video things and and he gave him three kinds of recovery the first was the car going on Texas Avenue which is the main drag in College Station the second was people walking in the big mall in College Station and the third was some of the ordinary natural parks in College Station what happened to the electrodes on people's bodies well uh, blood pressure what you see is this is the the uh, the time limit here the, uh, this is the time limit here this is the pressure up here what you see is nature viewers come down much faster recover much faster than do the others and so you've got um, uh, skin kind of, uh, you've got muscle tension and you see the same thing and you've got um, skin conduits and you see the same thing and he's got all these physiological tests they're saying the same thing that you recover from stress much easier and so Roger's conclusion was the findings clearly showed that individuals recovered faster and more completely from stress 
when they were exposed to nature as opposed to any of the urban settings. And so he's done a bunch of these experiments. In my judgment, it may prove quite difficult to locate urban settings lacking nature that have physiological relaxation consequences matching those of the unspectacular nature amenities in this study. So now here's another study. You're lying on the body, waiting to go in the operating room, right? And so you're kind of tight, you know, and you're about to practice their carpentry skills yet again on your body. And so you're lying here and you're looking at the ceiling. So he gave them three different ceilings to look at. He had three different operating rooms set up. The first was a white ceiling. And you can see this is the control group, the, the average hospital thing. The second ceiling had animals staring down at you. And uh, um, that was sort of a rousing one here. And you can see that was a little better than the control one. But, but this one, where you had nature scenes on the ceiling, you were totally relaxed going in there. I mean, it had an extraordinary effect upon you. Jen, again, please. And so now, um, Roger's wife is Danish, and so you can do some things in Scandinavia you can't get away with in American hospitals. And so he, uh, he did a study over in, uh, over in Copenhagen where he had 160 heart bypass patients over a three-year period. And, when he, and Roger said, when you come out of Pass. Your, uh, your, your facing, your bed is sloping down a little bit and you, you're, you're stuck with looking at the end of your bed. And so Roger gave them something here to look at at the end of their bed. And the first thing they looked at was uh, a white wall, just as you would in any hospital room. The second thing they looked at was a, an, a piece of abstract art. And the first thing they looked at was a nature scene. And the question was, well, Roger uh, said after eight months, he had to sort of um, uh, 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 change the experiment because people were dying looking at the abstract art. And so they had to, they finished <laughs> up with the, the white scene and the, and the nature scenes. But it got better fastest. Well, you know the answer now. So the nature scenes got better fastest. And so if you go to your dentist today or your physician, if they know what the dentist is doing, she'll have her chair facing out of a window looking at nature. Your physician will have nature scenes around the walls. You know, this is, this is Ulrich, Ulrich's stuff. And so this is the cancer center at Stanford Nature Center. He's at Stanford Medical Hospital with whom Roger works. And he started putting these things in and then he got more elaborate as they proved to be successful. And you see what they're doing in the cancer wards now, and my daughter's just gone through a bunch of this, so, so it's incredibly relaxing when you put nature in there. And so, again, we're in the cancer, cancer treatment wards out there. So, so we know it has an impact. We have a huge literature on that. And so, uh, does that have any impact on, on your work? Of course it does. It has cost implications. It has all kinds of implications that you can draw from. There's science to support it. And then, and then of course, you had Ed Wilson, who's probably the most influential uh, uh, natural biologist in the last the latter quarter of the 20th century. Ed, Ed o. Wilson at Harvard wrote, and I'm sure you've read the book Biophilia that Ed Wilson wrote. And, and he's, he's writing there quite uh, obviously very knowledgeably. Humankind evolved from natural environments there's a genetic predisposition to pay attention and respond positively to vegetation, water, and other natural elements. And this whole biophilia phenomenon, which is and has now received widespread acknowledgement and respect in the academic community. And so uh, here's a couple more of Roger's uh, studies. This is again, um, this is the view from the road. Do roadsides dominated by natural elements mitigate travel-related stress? And Parsons was one of Roger's uh, graduate students. 160 participants who used uh, these measures, physiological measures of skin conduits, cardiovascular activity and facial muscle tension. Treatments, he had basically the two I want to talk about. Passive stressor, he had a 12 minute black and white video of workshop injuries and accidents done again by um, professional actors. And he gave them four different environments to drive through after they'd looked at this. The first was a forest here, and this was the forest scene dominated by natural vegetation. 
and then there was a golf course seen on one side and natural vegetation on the other and then there was a mixed um, light development in residential neighborhoods and then there was an urban site there and he wanted to know who was least stressed and he had these electrodes on people and so he concluded that, no, he found, the electrode showed, individuals were more stressed by the urban than the nature-dominated environments. Does that have any, anything for you, say, in your community? Well, of course it does. Absolutely it does, that you can l relate to. Um, let me pass on. Uh, let me ke keep going. <coughs> and keep going, one more. I want to move on a little bit here. So the participants had great, oh, oh yeah, uh, no, let me skip that one too. <laughs> <laughs> let me, uh, on the, I want to move on to the next couple of things. So, so this is a more recent study, a Dutch study of uh, 1155 neighborhoods, self-reported health of over 10,000 people related to land use data using GIS on the amount of green space in their living environment. And so uh, the land use data, percent of green space in the area, percent of blue space, which was water stuff, uh, and the presence of a garden. And then their self-reported health indicators, the number of symptoms and experiences in the past 14 days, and their perceived general health from very good to very belt. And they look for the relationship, what did they find? In a greener environment, people report fewer symptoms and have better perceived general health. Also, the people's mental health appears to be better. The size of the effect is considerable. And so there's a substantial science literature to support if mental stress is what you want to focus on, there's a substantial scientific nature there to, um, to support it. Uh, Kaplan's were Roger's um, gurus, they were his mentors, and they had a job pressures project. Uh, the finders indicated that workers with a view of natural elements, such as tree and flowers, felt their jobs were less stressed, were more satisfied with their jobs than others who had no outside view. If you look out on nature, your day, you're much more productive, you, you're less, uh, less time off nature than if you're stuck in a cubicle inside where you've got no access to any of that sort of stuff. Uh, let me say a word or two about trees, because trees are the essence of urban nature. You've uh, all invariably come back to trees. So, so you, you know the benefits of trees. They clean air and take out ozone and particulate pollutants and carbon dioxide. They reduce energy costs, shade trees, and they reduce the heat island effect. How do you get trees funded? Not out of the general fund. What you do is what I did in College Station was go to the utilities department, which the city owns, and say to them, look at the demand side of your operation. You know, if you put in trees, you reduce the heat island effect which, as you're very familiar with, the, uh, you, you know, the, the, the heat in the cities is going to be about five degrees higher than it is out in the rural countryside for all kinds of reasons. And so, so it, by putting in trees, reducing that heat index because of reducing the hard surface there, you are reducing the electricity bills for our residents. And so I had our electricity departments foot the bills for planting trees, uh, street trees. And we got that done. Now, my, after, after I left the department, after I left the city, in came the Tea Party and they canned it, unfortunately. But, but vi it's a viable way of going forward. There are many cities in America who have utility departments funding trees. I don't know if Mr. White, if it's still done in Houston, but my daughter was, a, was an aide for Mr. Bill White when he was a mayor of Houston. Christine worked for him for uh, many years, including his run for governor in, in 2012. Uh, or 2010, uh, and, um, and uh, Mr. White put in a system whereby 1% of every road bill in Houston went for street trees. A 1% of a road bill is a bunch of money, you know. So again, you're not looking at the general fund for it, you're tying it into someone you can get there for, get it applied to your, to your situation, because you're solving a problem. In Houston's case, of course, they were under all kinds of federal uh, uh, um, the problems because of pollution and so on. They had, they had recently captured the number one position from LA as being the most polluted city in America and wasn't doing their, uh, business, their, uh, their efforts to attract business any good. And so, so you were solving a problem by planting trees, which is what Mr. White did. <coughs> Let me move on a little bit. How am I doing on time, Jim? What's that, what's that time? I'm going to help you with there. Oh, okay. Nine. Okay, we're good. We got a few more minutes? All right, so, so let's talk about crime. Do you have anything to do with crime? Children, nature, and crime. Well, let's have a look. Um, 
um, greater sense of safety, fewer incivilities, less aggressive and violent behavior, lower levels of crime. We've got a body of literature now, scientific literature that works, that demonstrates the impact here. The seminal study was done by, uh, by QO and her, and her graduate students at the University of Illinois back about uh, 15 years ago. And they did their seminal work at the Ida B. Wells Housing Project in Chicago. Now this project, 5,700 people lived there, 97% African American, 93% unemployed, uh, one of the 12 poorest neighborhoods in America. Surprise, surprise, crime was an issue. And so what Kyo did, what she did, was she went through this project, and I'll show you some pictures of it in a minute, and she graded each little section of the project from zero to four in terms of zero, no trees or grass, no greenery, no nature, four completely covered with a tree canopy and grass. She also looked at the police crime reports in this massive project. She looked at property crimes, which were thefts, burglary and arson, and she looked at violent crimes, which were assault and, and homicide. And she put the two together. And so this is the complex. And you can see it's a massive complex as you go in through there. Um, here are some pictures of the thing. This is tree covered, some parts of it. You had high vegetation. And QO loan me these slides. And you can see the contrast when you get to the zero area. It's a harsh environment. And so, so what did she find? Another, you know, pretty harsh environment in there. And so what did she... Uh, let me keep going. What did she find? Well, um, this is the total crimes down here. This is the vegetation level along the horizontal axis. So if you had low vegetation down at the zero and ones, you had far more crimes. As you moved along to high vegetation, you had far fewer crimes. And this held for both the um, property crimes and violent crimes. As you had low vegetation, you got more property crime, low vegetation, more violent crime. It was consistent across, the, across, the, across both axes. Uh, if you compare the total crime in the uh, uh, high, high vegetation area and the medium vegetation area with the low vegetation area, it was substantially reduced where there was vegetation. And so, <clears throat> And so QO concluded, greener outdoor spaces receive greater use, thereby increasing surveillance, and also there's a psychological impact, less aggressive and violent behavior, less incivility associated with those, uh, those vegetative um, uh, conditions. Um, I have been a periodic visitor to South Africa, and I have been there quite a bit in the 80s before apartheid and I was there uh, sort of in the early 90s when uh, Mandela was um, uh, negotiating and uh, it looked like apartheid was coming to an end and I have been there since that time as well. And by coincidence uh, in the 80s one time I was out there after I had been for three weeks in South Africa I went on to spend uh, three or four weeks in Christchurch and I went back later actually spent four months in Christchurch in New Zealand. And uh, when I was in Soweto, when I was in South Africa, they put me in a helicopter and we went up over Soweto. And it was um, short, uh, just as apartheid was, um, was ending and people from the countryside were piling in to Soweto. Soweto is the uh, southwest township in Johannesburg. It is the largest city in, in Africa. Nobody knows how many people live there. The best guess is four or five million. But, but they had a golf course of all things in Soweto. And, and what the government of Soweto said was, uh, these people coming in, you can, you can have the first nine holes of the golf course to put your shacks up. So that's what they were doing in Soweto. And so I was up in a helicopter, and interestingly enough, they kept this bit empty, which sort of puzzled me at first. I'll come back to that in a moment. <clears throat> then I went on to Christchurch. And when I got to Christchurch, I was doing a, doing a workshop there. The mayor introduced me, and she didn't know what I was going to talk about at all. But she said, you know, in Christchurch, nobody gets mad. Everybody's sort of laid back. Well, of course, 
I mean, it's the most beautiful city I've ever been in. It's spectacular. You've got the Southern Alps behind it. You've got magnificent greenery all the way through. You've got gardens. You look at Soweto, and, and you've got these, these concrete block houses, row after row, without a tree in sight in there. You compare that with Christchurch. I mean, <laughs> the level of stress was blatantly obvious as a result of the cities, just looking at them. In Soweto, they didn't have much. You know, there was an occasional central water spigot, but it was primitive existence. I have to tell you that I was in a pig, what they call an armored vehicle at that time. I was in an armored vehicle taking these things down there with two escort armored vehicles behind me as we went in there. <coughs> and you compare it with Christchurch. And so, of course, Soweto's tense, stressed. Well, I mean, of course, there's that kind of tension in there because there's no vegetation, there's no nature, of course. Christ Church is relaxed because it's such a spectacular uh, nature city. Incidentally, what is that? And so, and so Jim is right. And so these people who had nothing, had nothing, had patrolled themselves, they controlled themselves and decided their kids needed a soccer field. And that's what that was. The kids had to play somewhere. They left it out for a soccer field. And so, you know, you've all been raised on Mr. Maslow's, uh, you know, hierarchy stuff about, uh, about, and of course he was a psychiatrist and, and whatever, and y you know, you've got to have your physiological needs before you can get your safety done, and, and, and what we do is up here, and of course a lot of claptrap. I mean, there's no sort of ever been any, any evidence supporting that. I mean, of course these people needed a soccer field, they didn't have any of this stuff down here. You don't just sort of wait till these things happen. You integrate this stuff as you go along. So let's say a word or two about physical health, and then I have to shut up, right? So, so let's talk a word about physical health. And so you, you know you've got physical health problems. You know, and, and can you contribute to it? Well, you know, the, the, um, let's just whiz through this. They all know this. So I'm not going to, I mean, we know we're in trouble. You know, just keep going, keep going, keep going. All right, so, so, so we know that activity-friendly neighborhoods and open spaces create opportunities to reduce obesity. We know that. It's not about parks. It's about integrating nature into the community. And then people, if it's convenient, they will exercise if it's close by, convenient, and attractive. That's what we know. Um, I can't, as a social scientist, ever prove to you, prove to you, that parks and nature uh, eliminate or help obesity. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons I can't. There's too many factors in obesity, and I can't tie it to one. I'm not going to tell you why I can't, but there's all kinds of reasons I can't keep going. So, so, but, but I don't have to. There's a natural nexus in people's minds that makes sense to them that, indeed, if we have parks and nice places for people to walk, they do it, and therefore it fits. And so maybe we can make a contribution, and maybe that's your position. That indeed you can, because you do that, you can do that. Keep, keep rolling these, I don't want to... Oh, oh, back up one. This, I want to make this point. Um, who are the... If I look at the history of parks, urban parks in America, I don't have time to take you through it. You're having to take me on word. But the reason we have urban parks are health reasons. It has to do with miasmas and all this stuff. But we got urban parks because the physicians in America got involved. It was the physicians who got urban parks in the 1840s, 1850s. In New York, it was John Griscom, the chief uh, uh, physical uh, medical officer. In, uh, in Chicago, it was John Roach, who was president of the American Medical Association. In Boston, it was Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., who was the most influential physician in America at that time, um, uh, trained in France, and, and his speeches on parks, you get goosebumps just reading them, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, New Orleans, it was Ed Barnes. It was one physician after another who promoted urban parks. And I say, well, where are the physicians today? How many of you have physicians on your boards? The Pew Trust do a survey every year of who are the most trusted people in America. It's the same every year. Number one, nurses. Number two, pharmacists. And number three, medical doctors. They're the most trusted people in America. It comes out same time over and over again. 
uh, our, our senators don't form so well at 11 percent and members of Congress are 9 percent and uh, they, um, they, uh, they're down with the lawyers at 13 percent. But where are the medical people today on your advisory boards? They are people who have class and credibility and they know, they know about the science. I have a friend named William Green in England who's an ordinary general practitioner but absolutely gets the science of, of the impact of, of nature on stress and he's out there advocating it and has a major impact on national policy which I can never have as an advocate for parks but the physicians can because they trust you they need to be on your advisory boards they need to be educated and they need to be your advocates <coughs> Let me say a word or two then about economic development. Have I got another five minutes? Oh, three. Okay, well, we can do this. So let's talk about impact on business relocation decisions. <coughs> Go on, one more. And so here's an exercise I want you to do with your groups when you go back home. You have them get a piece of paper and you say, write down the place you'd like to live, give your druthers. <laughs> because they don't understand English, you spell out druthers for them. You prefer place ignoring practical concerns as a job, family, language and heritage. Write down the place of your dreams. Don't write down the job or family or anything. Write down the place of your dreams. And you give them a minute to do that. When they've done it, you say now, write in one sentence why you picked that place. And you give them a minute to do that. Now I have done this exercise hundreds of times all over the globe and I can tell you the answer. More than 80% of participants will cite some park, recreation, cultural, environmental ambience in their responses. When you think about the place of your dreams, it'll have something to do with park, recreation, ambience, environmental ambience, the place you want to live. Park that. More than 10,000 economic development groups are competing to attract businesses to our communities. We all have the footloose industries, the high tech, the R&D, the corporate headquarters, the upper end services, the people who can locate their stuff any place, they're not stuck to where the iron is or where the metal is or where the coal is or whatever, they can go any place. We're all trying to pull them in. What's, what are they? They're information factories. What's their main asset? Their main asset is high education professional employees. Beyond a threshold salary level, people are persuaded to locate by quality of life factors rather than money. You want economic development. Companies go where the talent is. What does the talent want? Well, you, you had them write it down. You had them write down. They want ambience, recreation, nice places to live and people will take a trip off at some point. You say to Crompton, Crompton, 10% um, uh, raise, come strut your stuff at my place. Nah, I've been at A&M forever, 10% ain't going to move me. 15, nah, well 20 I'd have to maybe listen. But, but you say to Crompton, Crompton, 10% decrease in salary, but the Colorado. What if hip hits up the wagons, we'll truck it. W what's me? Well, it ain't salary. It doesn't work like that in, Bar in College Station, Texas, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's what's moving, okay? And so I say this to my city council. They say, well, yeah, Crompton, but it, it doesn't, it, we can't do anything about that. We can't move the mountains to College Station. I said, well, you can't do you? Because they've already got natural amenities. And we want to do extra creating ambience and attractiveness in our communities. Or they can't come in because the competition. So no matter how quality of life is defined, and I don't have time to define it for you, but, but because I'm out of time, but, but parks, recreation, open space are a part of it. And uh, let me add, Crompton isn't from traveling this globe a fair bit. There's no great cities in this world that do not have a great park system. Now great isn't big, there's plenty of lousy big cities in this world. Great is defined as a place you want to live. There are no places you want to live that have a great park system. And so 
there's also a disability competition, uh, uh, compensation. So, so let me leave you with this slide and I'll, I'll quit. So, so companies located where there's only a mediocre quality of life have to pay high wages to attract the same quality workforce. And the companies know that. And you don't have a viable community unless you have businesses in the community because they're the only positive taxpayers you've got. Houses always cost you money. Why is it that A&M pays some of the highest salaries around? <laughs> well, you can draw your own conclusion. <laughs> College Station ain't the best place I'd be living if, <laughs> if all else was equal. And so, um, so that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Let me reiterate. Number one, create a focus that ties in with the important considerations in your community. Get into that focus. Make sure it's on outcomes. That you uniquely contribute to that focus and hammer, hammer, hammer it. Get yourself the science to support it. Put it out there, got on every agenda, get it in people's heads, and you will be successful. Thank you.